Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather together again, to spend time looking at your word and thinking about how it is special. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, uh, to grasp more fully uh, the, its importance and its story, the message of redemption that is sown through its pages from beginning to end. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As last week, do feel free to interrupt as we go along. So if you've got any questions, just shout them out and we'll see what we can do. So, so far we've looked at the reason why we can trust the Bible. We've seen that uh, nobody's disproved it. Uh, Jesus believed it. Uh, and so we can trust it. And actually one thing that I didn't touch on at all last week was the fact that often it is backed up by archaeological evidence as well. Um, and also personal experience that actually we know that the Bible is a unique book because of the power that it has to change lives and the power that it has to speak into our hearts. Hopefully we've all had it at different times that experience of, of the words coming alive to us. Um, so God's word is reliable. It's shown to change lives. We can trust it. What we're gonna look at today is um, what I've termed um, the big picture. In other words, what we're gonna look at is the story of the Bible, what's in there. And then next week, we'll focus in more uh, closely on the Old Testament and then the New Testament after that. So as we hopefully are aware, the Bible is not so much a book as a library, 66 books. I checked it. It is around 40 different authors um, over um, 1,500 years it was written down. As you'll know, written split into two halves, the Old Testament before Jesus and the New Testament after Jesus, or including Jesus. Question, what does testament mean? Any of you know? Um, Perfect. Well done. Well done. It means uh, covenant. That's right. So this is a, a word that the Bible uses quite a lot. And covenant is a, an agreement. Um, could be verbal, could be written, but it's, it's a solemn and binding agreement between two people or two parties who are in some sort of relationship with each other. So it's far deeper than just a contract in law, say. Um, marriage is actually an example of a covenant. So this solemn and binding agreement. And we're going to look a bit about covenant and old, old, what is old covenant and new covenant as we go along. And we're going to look at the big story of the Bible in a couple of different ways. We're going to look at it historically, what the events were, what events are covered from kind of page one of the Bible to whatever the page number of uh, Revelation chapter 22 is. Uh, but we're also going to look at it theologically, what, what is going on, what is God, God doing in all, in all this. Um, so we're going to have a look at the Bible timeline and of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. But just firstly, a couple of comments on timing in, in particular. So until the end of the 19th century, the dates were calculated almost totally from the, the statements within the Bible itself. So such and such ruled for you know, so many years, such and such lived this length of time when they were so, so old, they had a son, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problems with that are that one, the Bible doesn't actually record all those sorts of details. Or, or, you know, it's not a full account of those sort of details. Secondly, sometimes things can run consecutively, uh, sorry, um, concurrently rather than consecutively. So you've got overlapping dates. Um, and then thirdly, some of some figures in other ancient documents give slightly different figures or different versions. Um, so that's, that's one um, issue. 
Uh, and then basically, as, as time went on, modern scholarship tries to kind of draw in other data as well. So uh, from, from archaeology, from other historical documents. So drawing on, for example, you know, data from, from, ba uh, from Babylonian records, from Egyptian records, from Assyrian records, and kind of trying to correlate these things together to kind of get a more accurate timeline. Um, also, for example, in some of the Egyptian documents, um, they will relate particular astronomical occurrences. Um, Haley's Comet, or I'm not sure it does Haley's Comet, but if it did, actually we know that Haley's Comet comes around every so 72 years, is it? Can't remember, something like that. Um, so if a particular astronomical event is recorded, then we can pinpoint that to an actual year. Um, problem is though that there are different calendars used. Sometimes, for example, the reigns of kings were dated in slightly different ways. Um, so up on screen here, there's just some general kind of um, kind of markers that say that effectively the earlier you go, the harder it is to be precise for obvious reasons. So when you go back, back beyond 3000 BC, just in, these are just in general historical terms, you know, you can be centuries out in your dating. Um, come between 2000, 3000 BC, so third millennium BC, you know, maybe up to two centuries out. Then moving to the reason I've got those figures up there, 1400 to 1100 BC, that's kind of time when the Israelites come into the promised land. So actually we're being able to narrow timings to more like a, a decade. And then when you get to this date here, 587 BC, fall of Jerusalem, um, any error is almost nil. So in fact, I mean, in some of the ancient documents that even give the month that these things happen. So we can be pretty accurate on these things. Um, uh, a lot of data there, but hopefully we will get through this fairly quickly. Uh, by the way, the books of the Bible that, that are listed at the bottom, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Judges, those are showing the time periods that those books covered, not when those books were written, if that makes sense. So, for example, Genesis, you've got a period maybe from, well, back to creation through to uh, the time of Jacob and his family, which is maybe 1800, 1900 BC. Um, but Genesis was most likely written down by Moses you know, several hundred years later. So, as I said, we're going to scoot through this. And we, what we're going to do now is just look at the events that are covered in scripture. Um, so we've obviously got Genesis 1 and 2, uh, creation, talking where the Bible records God creating humans, made in God's image, um, given dominion over, um, over, over the earth. And you know, this is very much obviously in the period of prehistory, prehistoric times. Um, and as we looked at briefly last week, This is telling us the important fact that, that God made it, that God made it with a purpose, that human beings are the pinnacle of his creation, have a special place in his creation, are the only ones in creation made in his image. Um, so there is this fundamental, uh, these fundamental truths that are communicated right back for us in Genesis chapter one. In fact, I mean, you, may, you may want to turn to some of these cha uh, chapters or pages as we go along. So, yeah, page three and Genesis chapter one starts obviously in the beginning, God. So setting out what we are doing here as human beings, that we are here because we are God's creation. But then also Genesis chapter three, you've got the fall um, and we see disobedience being followed by division and being followed by death. And actually, as Christians, as humans, 
we cannot understand our world without a firm grasp of both those things of creation and the fall, that we are this, this mix of what is good and wonderful, but also that which is broken and, and bad. Um, so these opening chapters are setting out you know, this, this fundamental understanding of the world and why the world is as it is. So creation is full, absolutely fundamental to our understanding of who we are, why we're here, who God is, and his purposes and our relationship to him. Um, then, after the fall, so you get this, this event where creation is spoiled, things are marred, we are alienated from God. You know, this picture of the humans being driven out of the garden away from God's presence. And in a sense, the rest of the Bible is the story of how that is restored and redeemed. So you have right at the beginning, God's people in God's place. Um, but we will come on to the kind of more of the theological side of that later. So we have God's call then of Abraham the start, if you like, of his rescue mission. Um, and God calls Abraham from this town in, in Mesopotamia. He calls Abraham to leave this, this, this city, uh, what was a, a, civil, a very civilized city, and to go to a place that he would be shown, which eventually Abraham was shown was the land of Canaan. Um, so probably a good two months journey for him. Uh, except he stopped along the way. So um, it was considerably longer journey. Um, so God calls Abraham. And then you have this fundamental uh, chapter in Genesis 12, where God gives Abraham this, not only calls him, but gives him these promises that are going to be fundamental to the story of the Old Testament. And it's a promise of land, uh, well, does somebody want to read verses two and three of, of Genesis um, chapter 12? So that's on page 13. Thank you. Brilliant. So you have that promise of land, that promise of, um, in fact, God has, says about the land in verse in verse twelve. Uh, go to the land, to the land. I, uh, verse one. I go to the land. I will show you. And this this promise of descendants that he will be made into a great nation. This is a time when he didn't have any even a single son, um, and that there would be this special relationship with God. Uh, then Isaac. Is later is born 25 years later this is the promised son uh, who inherits this blessing so this is about kind of around 2000 bc give or take but it's that sort of you know that's a good kind of round figure to have in your mind 2000 bc for call of abraham so yeah the significance that this is the beginning of god's plan for restoration then we have the story of uh, the of Abraham's family, um, his, his grandson, Jacob, um, who is later given the name Israel by God. So the name, so whenever you hear Israel, that's just basically another name for Jacob. And it means he wrestles with God. Um, we have this strange story of Jacob wrestling with the angel, wrestling with God himself. Um, so this takes up a massive 20, basically half the book of Genesis is about the story of Joseph, uh, Jacob and his family. And Jacob has these 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel, um, which go on to be to form this nation. So it, this is the point at which God begins to build this group of people into the nation that he's promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Um, they end up in Egypt, and that's where they grow hugely uh, into this nation. So Genesis, this first book in the Bible, it covers 
a huge amount that is fundamental. So it is a really important book to, to know because so much of what happens in Genesis relates to the rest of the story of the Bible. So then we move on to the Exodus. So Jacob and his family have been in Egypt for around 400 years, give or take. And we have this story where Mo God sends his deliverer, Moses, to lead the people out of Egypt to the promised land, this, the land that, that God had promised to Abraham. Um, and then you have this story of God bringing them out, the, the, the plagues, um, and then this giving them this special meal, the Passover, which would marked their freedom uh, and this transition from slavery to freedom, from being slaves in Egypt to being, to being God's redeemed people. Um, as you may know, things didn't go completely uh, smoothly on the journey to the promised land. Um, they end up disobeying God fairly spectacularly and then spend 40 years wandering around in the wilderness as a result. But also the other significant thing about this time is it's the time where the law is given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, so that is kind of summed up particularly in the, the Ten Commandments of Exodus chapter 20, uh, in the books also of Levitica, uh, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And they are given on Mount Sinai, effectively instructions for what it is to be God's people. So if you turned on to Exodus uh, chapter 19, just, be just before um, Moses, uh, God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses. Um, and if you look at verse 5, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, page 76, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then there's that word again, covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So, again, a kind of fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham of this special relationship that these, this group of people, this nation, are going to, Abraham's descendants are going to have with God. Um, just a word about timings on this. There are two different schools of thought on the dating of the Exodus. Um, there is what is called the early date around. 1450 BC, or the late date, 1250 BC. Um, I won't kind of go into it now if you are interested in at asking questions about that at, uh, at the end. I favour the early date, but that's a different, uh, different discussion for maybe or time of questions. Um, then we have, after the 40 years of wild, wild, um, wandering around the wilderness, we have the conquest of Canaan involving crossing the Jordan into the promised land. So the Israelites have kind of come up from the wilderness. They're on the east side of the Jordan. And there's this moment where they cross the Jordan River, no longer under the leadership of Moses, but under the leadership of his successor, Joshua. They enter the promised land going across the Jordan, east to west, and the conquest of this land begins, this land that God has given to them. Um, so th by this time, it would be around 1400 BC or obviously 1200 if you take the later date. Then we have the period of, of conquest, which is recorded in the book of Joshua. Uh, but we go on to the time of the judges. If any of you are following the daily Bible readings in church at the moment, we are reading through the book of Judges, which is almost unremittingly bleak, not entirely, but Judges is characterised by this cycle that happens again and again and again and again, where the people disobey God, he disciplines them by handing them over to their enemies, they eventually cry out to God to be delivered. God sends a leader, a judge, 
uh, as they are called. Um, and they're mainly kind of military leaders rather than spiritual leaders who then delivers them from whichever enemy it is who's oppressing them, be it the Midianites or the Ammonites or various other people whose names end in it. So various judges, Gideon, Samson, probably two of the uh, most famous ones, but there, there are many others as well. Um, so during the time of Judges, one of the significant things that is said in the book of Judges, in fact, it happened in today's reading, which is about as bleak as any part of the Bible, Genesis, uh, sorry, Judges chapter 19, and it starts Genesis 19, verse 1, in those days Israel had no king. Um, and in fact, the, the very last verse in Judges, the book of Judges, if you want to turn to it, page 266, um, it sums up the whole story of this period of Judges, which probably was about for about 300 years. And it says, Judges 21, 25, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And it was a recipe for disaster. Eventually, um, God raises up the final judge, uh, a prophet named Samuel. Um, and under Samuel, the people finally decide that they want a king that in a sense, it's rejecting God as king. They want to be like the other nations who've got a king who can lead them out into battle. Um, and so we move into the time of the first kings. So we're looking at the books of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and the first half of the book of 1 Kings. The first king, King Saul, from the Benj tribe of Benjamin, um, doesn't go well with him. God replaces him with this, this, this boy as he is to start with, well, he's probably, he was probably, to be honest, late teens or 20, um, David, not from the tribe of Benjamin, but from the tribe of Judah. Um, and actually, Jacob, way back in Genesis, actually prophesies that the scepter, that the, the ruler will come from Judah. And this is the fulfillment of that. Um, from a prophecy effectively about a thousand years earlier. Um, and in fact, David's line would reign for over 400 years, which in any kind of ancient culture was extraordinary to have a kind of hereditary line of kings that lasted 400 years. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Um, but God had promised. And we'll come back to that later, that David would always have a descendant upon the throne. Um, and you then get to this split of the kingdom. So the kingdom starts under, you get these three kings, Saul, David, and David's son Solomon, um, who rule over this united kingdom. Um, but then, basically, this is a hugely busy chart, don't worry about it too much. Um, the headlines are the kingdom splits. Basically, David's grandson was an idiot um, and really kind of cheesed off the rest of the tribes of Israel who weren't from Judah. And they basically said, well, stuff you, tribe of David, we're going to go off and do our own thing, which they did. So this is around 930, well, 931, if you want to be precise, the kingdom splits. And you have the northern, the kingdom to the north, which is called Israel, and then the kingdom to the south, which is called Judah. Um, and Jerusalem is right kind of at the northern tip of what is Judah, but it's still counted as the, um, the southern kingdom. Um, and what this chart shows. So you've got the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom at the top, um, and the kings of the southern kingdom, Judah, at the bottom. And the thing to really notice is um, 
the green line and the blue line. Uh, and that's kind of shows the spiritual state of these different kings. And it, it's fair to say that the Northern kings were complete failures, all of them, in terms of their spiritual life. They did not lead people to God. They led people away from God. Um, there was maybe a slight little blip in Jehu, um, but it was slight. When you look at the southern kings, and basically there were different kind of, you know, there's quite a number. There occasionally, for example, with Jehu, his son, his grandson, his great grandson, and maybe the next generation after that actually ruled, but that was the end of his line. So sometimes the line of a king was was literally just him. Sometimes he had a son on the throne, but then that was that was it. Um, so lots of different kind of lines of kings in the, in the north. Um, Judah, um, okay, they're all descendants of David, um, but they are a very mixed bunch. So there were some wonderful godly kings um, and then shocking evil kings. But actually, even the, the godly kings, they didn't get it all right. All of them stuffed up in one way or another. Even David stuffed up in, in one way, and Solomon certainly stuffed up. So even the best kings were flawed kings. Um, we'll return to the prophets next week. Um, but you've got these two other dates, um, which are particularly significant. In 722 BC, the Assyrians come and basically smash the northern king, kingdom to smithereens. They part most of them off into exile in Assyria. They leave a small number in the land. In fact, it's not just they leave some others in the land. They bring captives that they from other lands they have conquered and put them in Israel. And they take the Israelites and put them in other lands they conquered. That was the Assyrian policy basically mix everybody up, take away any national identity. So the only identity you have is of being Assyrian, effectively. Um, and so that was the end of the, the Northern Kingdom. And actually, the Northern, it's the Northern Kingdom that then give rise to the Samaritans of the New Testament. So those that have a mixed race of, of, of Jews and then all these others who have come into the land which is why the kind of those around Judah down south looked down on them because they weren't as they saw them, you know, pure, pure Jews anymore. So the Northern Kingdom is no more after 722. Um, the Kingdom of Judah kind of limps on under its kind of mix of kings for about another 150 years. They managed to, they managed to under King Hezekiah, resist the Assyrians, and God does an amazing deliverance of them from the Assyrians. Um, but things continue to kind of go into decline, terminal decline in Judah, and eventually the southern kingdom falls to the Babylonians. Um, now, the reason that this, it, they're not sure whether it's 587 or 586, is, is down to kind of which month this, this act, the actual fall happened in. Um, so it's, a, again, a fairly precise dating. Um, and you, found, you, find, you find, for example, you know, records of it in the, Babylonian, um, in the Babylonian records. The thing to say about both these falls of um, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom is that God had warned them constantly that this would happen if they keep disobeying him. In fact, right back, it, before they go into the promised land, Moses does this great long sermon, which is effectively the whole of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, the, whole, the whole of the narrative of Deuteronomy probably happens kind of more or less at one sitting, or at least over a very short length of time. And Moses warns them in that book, you know, if you live according to God's, if you live in accordance with God's laws, all will go well, he will bless you. If you don't, you will, God's curse will come upon you. God, God will bring his punishment upon you. And one of those things is that you will be taken from your land. And that's what's happening. 
in these uh, exiles. Basically, the, the, the main problem with, with both Israel and Judah is that they started worshipping God in their own way and thought it was fine to worship Yahweh, but they'd worship the gods of Canaan alongside them. So, um, although some kings were even worse, I mean, so the problem was the first king of the first king of Israel, Jeroboam, when they rebelled um, and basically said, we're going to do our own thing. He knew that God had said you could only worship in Jerusalem at the temple. This, this was going to be a problem because all his people, this new kingdom, were going to, on a regular basis, be traipsing down to the southern kingdom, to Jerusalem. And so he went, you know what, we're going to have our own centres of worship. Oh, and let's make some bulls golden calves so immediately and, and they set them up at what had been one of the kind of spiritual centers before the kingdom split on the spiritual kingdom uh, centers and they they put golden calves there to worship instead of god um so in their minds they may uh, there's a bit of debate you know did they think they were still worshiping yahweh when they were worshiping these bulls you know but just a representation of Yahweh, or had they gone completely AWOL spiritually? And that there is some debate about, about that. Um, but effectively, any kind of, uh, any proper following of Yahweh went out the window. Part of the problem would have been that it was likely that the, the copies of the law would be in Jerusalem, not where they were. So actually, they would lack the people to teach them. Um, and in fact, what happened was the, those that were kind of counted partly as, as teachers, people like priests and Levites, they had been distributed throughout Israel when they went into the promised land. They had their, their towns throughout Israel. When the northern kingdom decided they were going to do their own thing, a lot of them, actually, the Levites and priests, left their towns to come south to be in Judah to have access to the temple. So again, you've taken away, you've lost kind of your spiritual influence or spiritual leaders again. We will come back to it slightly next, next week because God didn't leave them, the northern kingdom, because he kept sending prophets. So actually, Elijah and Elisha, two of the greatest prophets, they weren't sent to the southern kingdom, they were sent to the northern kingdom. So that's where they were ministering. That They were speaking to these, these you know, kings like Ahab. Um, but we'll come back to that a bit next, next week. Um, but so when Judah falls, basically, Nebuchadnezzar smashes the city and takes the people off into exile in Babylon. Um, he doesn't actually bring, as the Assyrians did, others into the land. He just leaves a few kind of of the poorer Jews to kind of farm the land and to kind of look after it. But basically the bulk of the of the population and certainly the cream of the population, the educated people, the skilled craftsmen, they were cast off to Babylon. But the interesting thing is that actually in Babylon, Although we don't know a great deal about the exile, it seems that actually the Jews were allowed to live together. So they weren't dispersed into and among the Babylonians. They kept their own national identity. Um, and what happens... Oh, sorry. I'm getting it slightly ahead of myself. Um, so they're in the exile. But one of the, one of the things about the exile is that there is this huge crisis because what has happened to God's promises because no, they no longer have their, their land that God had promised to Abraham. They'd no longer got a king, a, a descendant of David on the throne that God had promised David. They no longer had the temple, the place where God had told them was the only place where they could offer sacrifices to him. So they'd lost these fundamental things about their identity. So it was a huge kind of crisis. But again, God hadn't left them. And, you know, God had told them that they, this was going to happen. So it's not like they didn't know this was coming. It's not like God wasn't in this. Um, and in fact, during the exile, God keeps sending them prophets. 
So the prophet Jeremiah, although he doesn't go to Babylon, he sends them letters. To, um, Ezekiel, the prophet, he begins his prophetic ministry whilst in exile in Babylon. Um, and th there are others as well, like obviously Daniel. Um, so we have the people in exile for uh, 70 years or thereabouts, as, as Jeremiah had actually pro uh, prophesied in advance that they would be there uh, 70 years. Um, but God was still speaking to them. Uh, the story of Esther also happens during the, this time. And then you have the return from exile. So God actually um, mainly uh, or initially through a decree by um, one of the kind of successors of Nebuchadnezzar. It's not another Babylonian. The Babylonians get, con uh, get uh, conquered by the Medes and the Persians. Um, and one of these... Uh, Persian rulers, Cyrus, issues an edict that allows the Jews to, to return home. Uh, and actually, they've got a copy of that edict. I forget which museum it's in. It's in one of the big, because it's, it's carved, you know, in cuneiform, in their form, on, on, a big, on a big seal, on a massive bit of stone. And Cyrus's edict is recorded, and you can see it at a museum somewhere, which I have forgotten. I'd like to say the British Museum, but I don't think it is. Um, anyway, the seal of Cyrus, look it up on the internet. Um, and so the people return and God raises up other leaders like Nehemiah, who, who um, organizes uh, the wall, the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Um, and Ezra, uh, also not only a teacher, but uh, they get the, the temple rebuilt as well. Um, so their national identity returns. Um, but then you get 400 years of silence um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, stuff is still happening, um, but it's like God's voice is silent. So there are no prophets. Uh, they, they have rulers, but it's, they're not kings of David's line. Um, so actually when Herod comes along, kind of, you know, Herod isn't, isn't a descendant from David in any way. He's not even properly Jewish. But there were also some kind of early books called the Apocrypha, which um, you'll find them in Bibles that the Catholics will use. You'll, uh, so I've got a Bible at home that's actually got the Apocrypha in it, um, which is, I think it's 12 books um, that Catholics would see as being useful for teaching but which wouldn't have the same authority as the rest of scripture. So even Catholics having the Apocrypha in their Bibles don't give them the, those books the same authority. But they do kind of actually relate to some of this period between the Testaments. Um, and you may hear about this, this family, the, the, the Maccabees, um, who actually kind of were great Jewish heroes and kind of became deliverers from some foreign oppressors during that time. But effectively, in terms of what, what God, is speak, God is saying through his prophets, you've got this 400 years of silence. So, which brings us to the New Testament. Another busy document. You can turn over your sheets for the New Testament. Um, and again, similarly to last, as I said before, um, particularly the horizontal books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, those are the periods they cover, not when those books were, were written down. Um, and then you've got the rest of the books in the New Testament. We'll, we'll look at this all in more detail in a couple of weeks' time when we look at more specifically the books in the New Testament. But of course, now we have the most significant events in the whole of world history. We have the ministry of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, which completes God's work of redemption. And I'll come back to this when we do a quick theological kind of overview after this. So I'm not going to say much at the moment. I'll come back in a second uh, to this. But also in the New Testament, so this is very, again, dated to around uh, Jesus's ministry around 30 AD, possibly best, best guess of it or best estimation of his death, AD 33. Um, 
And then shortly after that, you have his ascension, Pentecost, um, AD 33, the birth of the church, and then things like the mission of the church with the with the conversion of St. Paul, and then the disciples going out after Jesus's ministry, turn to Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8. So Jesus, before he's taken back in, up into heaven, um, says these words, when you you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be in my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that effectively is what happens in the rest of the, the New Testament. We see, and the book of Acts in particular, we see the disciples moving out, firstly in Jerusalem, then into Judea, then into Samaria, and then we see them moving out into the known world of the day. Um, the, the time of the new, the, the, the story of the church kind of finishes with, with Paul in, in Rome. Uh, but then kind of the rest of church history follows as the message of the gospel continues to go out into the world. Um, so these are the historical events, but they fit into God's picture uh, the bigger picture, if you like, of God's purposes for the world. So we're going to briefly just kind of look at these events in a slightly different way. And this is a kind of framework. So the bit down the bottom is everything that we've just looked at. Um, so these historical events have left on some kind of key events. And you've got this along this kind of horizontal line in the middle, that the main events of both the Old Testament and New Testament um, leading up to the thing that ha hasn't happened yet, Christ's return. That is, that is the next big event in God's plan, basically. This whole period is the last days, um, the last days which will finally finish uh, only when Christ returns. Um, and so we've got this period of world mission which will, which will go right up until the time that Jesus returns. But we've got what I want to us to look at is this four-part framework, if you like, at the top. Now, there are different ways we can look at it, but, but this actually is a very common sort of framework, although the words that you use may be slightly different. So God's great event of creation at the beginning, um, the fall, the thing that disrupted um, life on earth, and then this plan of redemption, which goes from the fall, and we'll go right through to <clears throat> the, the return of Jesus, when <clears throat> all things will be restored at the final restoration of God's purposes. So redemption, basically, is, is, is God's plan to put things right, starting with Abraham, Abraham's call, but culminating in uh, the coming of Jesus. Uh, and his his death and his resurrection. And in fact, this period of redemption, we, you can kind of think of that as, if you like, in three parts. Firstly, Israel, um, where God graciously bears with humanity and the people of Israel, um, who are meant to be a light to the world, but kind of fail in that. You know, it shows us that, that certainly that we cannot do it ourselves however much the Israelites tried, they could not um, be the people that God wanted them to be. And in fact, um, there's this classic verse in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter five, you need, needn't turn to it, where um, it's verse 28, 29, where Moses has just come down from that Mount Sinai. He, he's brought them the laws said to them, you know, do these things and you will be my people. And all the people kind of go, yay, we're going to do that. Brilliant. And then God said this, I've heard what this people said to you. Everything that they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commandments always so it might go well with them and their children forever. There's the problem. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me. They won't. And so 
we have the culmination of the work of redemption in the coming of Jesus, dying for our sins, giving us a possibility of a new start, a fresh start, or as Ezekiel promises it in the, in the Old Testament, a new heart. Uh, and in fact, Jeremiah talks about that as well, that actually the laws would no longer be written on tablets of stone, but on the heart, because that's what is needed, the, the change of heart. And that is what only the death of, and resurrection of Jesus can bring. Um, so dealing with that problem of sin once for all, as, as, as it has been said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And that's the problem that Jesus came to, to deal with through his death and resurrection. Um, so Israel, Jesus, and then the third kind of part of redemption or uh, period of redemption, the church. So God's new people, <clears throat> born of the spirit, a redeemed humanity, renewed humanity, um, given this task, this continuing task of res restoration. Um, one other way of, of looking at these things is, is promise and these covenants that we've talked about, because promise is a, a key theme, again, that, that runs through the whole of the Old Testament and God's dealings with us as human beings. And God makes various covenants at key points. So as we've already seen in Genesis 12, God makes a covenant with Abraham, this, this promise of, of land, of descendants, of, uh, of, of a special relationship of blessing with God, um, with the sign of circumcision to show that actually they were part of this covenant. Um, and this is, if you like, the beginning of the restoration, because in Eden, you have God's people in God's place under God's rule. And so here with Abraham, we have a promise of people and a particular place to be, a particular relationship with God of being under his rule. And then... Later, you have this covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai. Again, it's another covenant, another promise um, that they would be his people. He would be their God if they will keep his commandments. And as we've seen, that was a problem. Um, but then God also makes a covenant with David. And so this is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And God promises David that he will be on, he, uh, he will have a descendant who will rule on his throne forever. Um, and of course, as we've already said, the problem was when the time of exile came, um, when they did no longer had a descendant of David upon the throne. And you know what had happened, had God's promise failed? But of course, as we know, it, it's fulfilled in Jesus. So when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, Mary, Luke chapter one, um, verse 32, Speaking of Jesus, um, he will be great and we be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So God's promise to David hadn't failed, but there'd been a gap before the king to whom the promise was ultimately given came, the king who would reign forever, uh, Jesus. Um, and then in the New Testament, we have Jesus bringing this new covenant that the, that the prophets had spoken of in the Old Testament. And it's a promise of forgiveness through his shed blood. As you'll remember, when, when Jesus, uh, when we have the, um, the Passover, uh, Jesus is sharing the Passover meal with his disciples. And in Matthew uh, chapter 26, you have him saying at, at this last supper, uh, he takes the cup uh, and he gives it to them and says, drink from it, all of you. This is my, this is my blood of the covenant. Some manuscripts have new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So this new covenant, this new relationship agreement that is not based upon our obedience to law, but is based upon Jesus's perfect obedience to all that his father um, asked. 
and we have the gifts given of the forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit to bring about that new heart, um, new obedience to God, and the gift of eternal life. Um, just as Abraham's, you remember Abraham's covenant had the sign of circumcision? The new covenant has signs as well. So we have baptism, the sign that we've entered into the covenant, and communion, the sign that we are part of God's covenant people. Um, if you look on the back of your, your sheets, I've got some verses of Revelation from Revelation at the bottom. And I wonder whether somebody could read those out, because here we have what we are looking forward to, the, the final restoration. Again, God's people in God's place under God's rule. Does somebody want to read those verses, Revelation? Yeah, Belinda, that would be great. Revelation 21 and verses 1 to 3. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Thank you. So it's, it's Eden restored, but actually it's, it's more than Eden, it's the earth restored. Because notice what it, it said there that actually here's the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Although we may speak of us going to heaven, actually the truth is that in God's final purposes, it's heaven coming down to earth. Any questions? I know we've covered a huge amount of ground in the whole story of the Bible, <laughs> historically and theologically. So I'm aware that I've given you a lot of information there. I mean, a lot of it you will have already have known, I'm, no, no doubt, but uh, hopefully just seeing the whole big picture together was kind of helpful. So um, the question was for those listening in case um, you didn't hear it, what I was saying about the kings not being Jewish, they were, they were Jewish, but they weren't descendants of David. So they were from these other, uh, the rest of the tribes. Interestingly, actually, although we talk about the southern kingdom of Judah, it was also Benjamin stayed with, with them. So actually, the, the, the southern kingdom effectively was the territory of both Benjamin and, and Judah. Um, and so these other kings were from all different tribes of, of Israel. That, so they were still descendants of Abraham. So the kings who weren't descended were those, so King Herod at the time of the New Testament, he was actually more an, an Edomite uh, from, the, from the south, although probably had Jewish blood within him somewhere. All these kings, all of them were flawed. Even the greatest of them were flawed. And it was like they needed something different, something better. And the only person who could fulfill that was Jesus. They'd had 300 years of judges who weren't kings, but were leading the people. And the book of Judges is a complete car crash kind of thing. It's, it's a people. So the problem is the problem of the human heart. So whatever human leaders they have, whether they're called kings or whether they were the priests or the Levites or, or judges, actually the fundamental problem of the human heart hadn't been solved and wouldn't be solved until Jesus came. And actually the prophets, I think, make clear that, that you know, it, it isn't just the failure of the kings, it's the failure of the people as well. You know, it, it's not just the kings that get it wrong, it, it's the whole nation that gets it, gets it wrong, that, that falls into idolatry. You know, the kings, the kings had a, a particular role in, in leading the people and, you know, they were probably more culpable because they led people in the the wrong direction but the people willingly went you know they had hearts that were prone to worshipping idols and foreign gods and you know idols and foreign gods that actually didn't require anything of them really other than their kind of sacrifices or their incense you know do your sacrifice and then go and live as just you as you want to any final questions i'm conscious that uh Time is ticking. Um, just a quick one, and I may have this completely wrong because I'm going by memory, but 
Um, you were mentioning the Jesus descendants from David. Was that on his father's side? Interesting question. Basically, both Matthew and Luke have genealogies for Jesus. And it's generally reckoned that the genealogy in Matthew is through Joseph, descended from David. But obviously, Jesus wasn't a genetic descendant of Joseph. The genealogy in Luke, I think it's generally thought that that is his descendant um, through, through Mary, through the line of Mary. So actually, he is a blood descendant of David, but through Mary. Um, but the greater thing is that he is the kind of, if you like, the, the spiritual descendant of, of, of David, you know, or the fulfiller of his, of God's promises to him. Okay, shall I pray to finish with? Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this story of redemption, the story of your unparalleled love for your people and the way that you have broadened your people to encompass uh, the whole earth. Lord, thank you for showing us that, that we could not do it ourselves, that we have hearts that, that need to be renewed. And Father, we thank you that you, you have done that through Christ and that one day that work of redemption and restoration will be complete that one day we will once again be in your perfect creation and able to see your face. We praise you, Lord God, that your plans and purposes never fail. Help us to trust them. In Jesus' name, amen.